Craig Kielberger reflects on working toward peace. Personal essay by Craig Kielberger. When I was very young, I dreamed of being Superman, soaring high above the clouds and swooping down to snatch up all of the bad people seeking to destroy our planet. I would spend hours flying across the park, stopping momentarily to kick a soccer ball in my path or to pat my dog, Muffin, who ran faithfully at my heels. One day, when I was 12 years old and getting ready for school, I reached for the newspaper comics. On the front page was a picture of another 12-year-old boy from Pakistan with a bright red vest and his fist held high. According to the article, he had been sold into bondage as a weaver and forced to work 12 hours a day tying tiny knots to make carpets. He had lost his freedom to laugh and to play. He had lost his freedom to go to school. Then, when he was 12 years old, the same age as me, he was murdered. I had never heard of child labor and wasn't certain where Pakistan was. But that day changed my life forever. I gathered a group of friends to form an organization called Free the Children. Over the past four years, in my travels for Free the Children, I have had the opportunity to meet many children around the world. Children like Jeffrey, who spends his days in a manila garbage dump, alongside rats and maggots, where he sifts through decaying food and trash, trying to salvage a few valuable items to help his family survive. He dreams of leaving the garbage dump one day. I have met children like eight-year-old Muni Anal in India, with a pretty ribbon in her hair but no shoes or gloves, who squats on the floor every day separating used syringes gathered from hospitals and the streets for their plastics. When she pricks herself, she dips her hand into a bucket of dirty water. She dreams of being a teacher. I have met children in the sugarcane fields of Brazil who wield huge machetes close to their small limbs. The cane they cut sweetens the cereal on our kitchen tables each morning. They dream of easing the hunger pains in their stomachs. Poverty is the biggest killer of children. More than 1.3 billion people, one quarter of the world's population, live in absolute poverty struggling to survive on less than one dollar a day. Seventy percent of them are women and children. I dream of a day when people learn how to share, so that children do not have to die. Every year, the world spends eight hundred billion dollars on the military, four hundred billion dollars on cigarettes, one hundred sixty billion dollars on beer, and forty billion dollars playing golf. It would only cost an extra $7 billion a year to put every child in school by the year 2010, giving them hope for a better life. This is less money than Americans spend on cosmetics in one year. It is less than Europeans spend on ice cream. People say, we can't end world poverty. It just can't be done. The 1997 United Nations Development Report carries a clear message that poverty can be ended if we make it our goal. The document states that the world has the materials and natural resources, the know-how, and the people to make a poverty-free world a reality in less than one generation. Gandhi once said that if there is to be peace in the world, it must begin with children. I have learned my best lessons from other children. Children like the girls I encountered in India who carried their friend from place to place because she had no legs, and children like Jose. I met Jose in the streets of San Salvador, Brazil where he lived with a group of street children between the ages of 8 and 14. 
Jose and his friends showed me the old abandoned bus shelter where they slept under cardboard boxes. They had to be careful, he said, because the police might beat or shoot them if they found their secret hideout. I spent the day playing soccer on the streets with Jose and his friends. Soccer with an old plastic bottle they had found in the garbage. They were too poor to own a real soccer ball. We had great fun until one of the children fell on the bottle and broke it into several pieces, thus ending the game. It was getting late and time for me to leave. Jose knew I was returning to Canada and wanted to give me a gift to remember him by, but he had nothing. No home, no food, no toys, no possessions. So he took the shirt off his back and handed it to me. Jose didn't stop to think that he had no other shirt to wear or that he would be cold that night. He gave me the most precious thing he owned, the jersey of his favorite soccer team. Of course, I told Jose that I could never accept his shirt, but he insisted. So I removed the plain white t-shirt I was wearing and gave it to him. Although Jose's shirt was dirty and had a few small holes, it was a colorful soccer shirt, and certainly much nicer than mine. Jose grinned from ear to ear when I put it on. I will never forget Jose, because he taught me more about sharing that day than anyone I have ever known. He may have been a poor street child, but I saw more goodness in him than all of the world leaders I have ever met. If more people had the heart of a street child like Jose and were willing to share, there would be no more poverty and a lot less suffering in this world. Sometimes young people find life today too depressing. It all seems so hopeless. They would rather escape, go dancing, or listen to their favorite music play video games, or hang out with their friends. They dream of true love, a home of their own, or having a good time at the next party. At 16, I also like to dance, have fun, and dream for the future. But I have discovered that it takes more than material things to find real happiness and meaning in life. One day, I was the guest on a popular television talk show in Canada. I shared the interview with another young person involved in cancer research. Several times during the program, this young man, who was 20 years old, told the host that he was gifted, as indicated by a test he had taken in third grade. Turning my way, the host inquired whether I too was gifted. Never having been tested for the gifted program, I answered that I was not. When I returned home, my mother asked me, are you certain you aren't gifted? I realized that I had given the wrong answer. I was gifted, and the more I reflected, the more I concluded that I had never met a person who was not special or talented in some way. Some people are gifted with their hands and can produce marvelous creations in their capacity as carpenters, artists, or builders. Others have a kind heart are compassionate, understanding, or are special peacemakers. Others, again, are humorous and bring joy into our lives. We have all met individuals who are gifted in science or sports, have great organizational skills, or a healing touch. And, of course, some people are very talented at making money. Indeed, even the most physically or mentally challenged person teaches all of us about the value and worth of human life. I think that God, in fact, played a trick on us. He gave each and every person special talents or gifts, but He made no one gifted in all areas. Collectively, we have all it takes to create a just and peaceful world. But we must work together and share our talents. We all need one another to find happiness within ourselves and within the world. I realize now that each of us has the power to be Superman 
and to help rid the world of its worst evils, poverty, loneliness, and exploitation. I dream of the day when Jeffrey leaves the garbage dump, when Mooney and all no longer has to separate used syringes and can go to school, and when all children, regardless of place of birth or economic circumstance, are free to be children. I dream of the day when we all have Jose's courage to share.